Are you looking to land a job in SharePoint? Well, if you are, then this video is for you. In this video, I'm going to go through the top 10 SharePoint roles and what the different roles and responsibilities are for that particular job type. I feel like I can talk on all of these different types of roles inside of a SharePoint job because I've actually worked in all of these different roles over the past 10 years. So I feel like I know the ups and the downs, the pros and the cons, and can kind of tell you how they fit inside of an organization. So let's jump in and take a look at the first role. So the first job type is a SharePoint administrator. Now, this is probably the most commonly known job type when it comes to SharePoint because everybody's seen that. It's probably when you search for jobs online, it's probably like the SharePoint, it's probably the most commonly um, sort of seen job type that comes up in the results. Essentially, the role of a SharePoint administrator traditionally was all about overseeing the SharePoint environments. Now, when it was on-premise SharePoint that most people were using, um, that was actually mostly a full-time job, just trying to keep the servers going to make sure that it stayed up and running, which was a daily battle back in the day, trust me. And nowadays, when it's SharePoint Online, it's still essentially looking after the overarching environment, but it's more keeping track of all the different SharePoint sites which exist, making sure there's no sort of dormant kind of sites that are getting stagnant and not being used and making sure that the SharePoint sites that are being used are using the storage space effectively and you're not kind of maxing out on storage space or keeping things just for the sake of it or looking at making sure that things like personal documents going into OneDrive and things like that to make the most of that storage space. I know I bang on a lot about OneDrive, but everybody gets a terabyte of storage space. So don't fill up your SharePoint sites with kind of personal documents that don't need to be in a collaborational space. And that's the type of thing a SharePoint administrator will be looking at when they're assessing whether or not a SharePoint site um, storage space is at its capacity. The other things that a SharePoint administrator would be doing is managing permissions. Quite often, it might not be on a day-to-day -day basis. You might get sort of SharePoint site owners or we'll come on to talking about internet managers later on. They may be managing the permissions, but it's more a case of if someone wants to lock themselves out or something. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of permission-related um, information in this video. I've done tons of videos on that on my channel already before, but you should know the different types of SharePoint permissions. And the SharePoint administrator essentially will have the top tier, the god mode of all of the SharePoint access. So they can go in and give anyone access that they need to. And quite often it's the case of, say, somebody else leaves the organization and they've got to go in and they've got to give the person who's replacing that person who's left uh, access to the same SharePoint sites that they previously had access to. Um, and in summary, it's, in, it's ensuring that the overarching SharePoint environment stays reliable, people have the right level of access they need to, and keeping everything in order. The next role is a SharePoint developer. Now, there's almost like two different branches of this, and I even considered splitting that into two different roles, but the role itself as a SharePoint developer is the same regardless. So the two different types I see is what I would call a pro-code SharePoint developer and a low-code SharePoint developer. And be very careful when you're looking in job specs of, of what types of languages, programming languages, or technologies that they're wanting you to use, because that will then help guide that. A lot of job specs don't say, oh, it's a low-code SharePoint developer or pro-code, but you can guess by the types of things that they're talking about. So if they're talking about things like Power Automate, Power Apps, things like that, it could well be low-code. And if they're talking about um, sort of .NET, C Sharp, JavaScript, any of those types of things, you'd look at them of a pro-code um, type of developer. But the role of a SharePoint developer remains the same. It's to be able to design, develop, and customize SharePoint solutions using various different either programming languages, or as I say, low-code models. So actually, the way I got into the role of a SharePoint developer was more for a low-code kind of way. And this is way before the days of Power Apps and Power Automate and Power Platform. The way I got into SharePoint, originally, I was working with SharePoint 2010, in fact, I've actually dabbled with a bit of 2007 and 2003 as well in the early days, but mostly it was in SharePoint 2010. And what I was doing is I was using InfoPath to build out customized forms. And I was using SharePoint 2010 Designer to build out workflows, which then turned into 2013 workflows. 
and so forth. And then obviously all of that's been scrapped nowadays and we now use Power Automate instead to build our workflows. So my kind of path was really, I'm not a pro code developer. I should hold my hands up, I'm not a pro code developer. I'm the kind of level where I could take someone else's code and mix it up a little bit to make it work and hammer it in with a bit of shoestring and sellotape, but I, I couldn't write it from scratch myself. Um, so that always led me down a path of being more of a low code um, developer. So using Power Automate to build workflows, using Power Apps to customize forms and that sort of stuff. But as I say, that SharePoint developer role will remain the same. You're, you're building custom solutions with approval workflows, notifications, um, instead of document libraries, whether it's um, building out custom interfaces or embedding apps from Power Apps into SharePoint. These are all the different types of things a low-code developer might be doing. If you're going to go be going into a role which is uh, pro-code SharePoint developer, you might see in the job specs, it'll talk a lot about things like SPFX, or if it's not, it should be, because that is the kind of, the, the the default kind of programming languages that you need to know in order to build pro code solutions that sit inside of SharePoint. So Gone of the Days actually recently announced the kind of add-in model um, of SharePoint is, is gone and you need to be able to build web parts using SPFX. So the third job type we're gonna talk about is a SharePoint development manager. Now, this is a role that I've, I've played. It is a job type. It's a hat that I've worn inside of a, a team. And again, I'm not a pro code developer. So as a SharePoint development manager, you don't really need to know pro code. Um, definitely not if it's a low code solutions kind of area and, and you're already specializing in low code. Um, but it, it, it does help. I must admit, if I'm totally honest, it would have helped to know that so I could help the team members better on a on a day to day basis with actually the work that they're doing, but most of the job, ninety percent of the job, um, didn't actually focus on physical doing of work. What it actually was about was leading a team of developers, managing projects, working with project managers, um, working with clients, working with the developers themselves, and allocating resources and budgets and things like that to different uh, projects that we we're working on. Actually, the team that I was managing of the developers at the time weren't even based in the country that um, I actually worked in. Um, they were based in Portugal at the time. And um, again, that had some of its challenges, but it, it wasn't impossible. It was something that I could work around, um, make sure that I'm working with the team members to understand what it is that they're building, and then working with the clients to sort of talk to them about what we're doing and maybe doing demonstrations and things like that. Essentially being that kind of middleman between the development team, the customers and the sales team of the company at the time. But that's a SharePoint development manager. Quite often, um, a lot of people do sort of work their way up to that. They might have been a developer previously, and they've got personal skills, soft skills, communication skills, and they kind of work their way up into that role. Um, as it happened, I kind of transitioned from being a SharePoint project manager into the development manager when the opportunity arose. The next is a SharePoint business analyst. Now, Essentially, in this role, and this is a role, again, that I, I um, had some experience in whilst I was working at a very large bank. And the role of this is to be a business analyst, so collecting information, um, requirements, and things like that, and then producing technical specification documents and um, almost like recommendations, proposals, things like that. Um, and it's basically you, you are the kind of middleman between the customer or, or, or or in this case, it was internal, but it could be customers, external facing, that are requesting SharePoint solutions, and you've got to be able to translate their requirements into technical specifications. So again, it doesn't mean you have to be a pro code developer, but you should understand the fundamentals of SharePoint, how it's constructed, how lists work, how libraries work, all the kind of out of the box features of SharePoint, and at what point, essentially, the out of the box features will run out, and you'll need to go for a more custom developed solution rather than using out of the box stuff. Um, so the text here on this slide is wrong, leading a team of developers, that's wrong. Ignore that, sorry about that. Needs to go on the bloopers reel. Um, but essentially SharePoint Business Analyst is about making sure that the requirements are captured, documented in a way that is going to be understood by people afterwards. And um, quite often you're then working with it like a SharePoint developers in order to deliver the project as well, because you're then translating what the customer has been requesting um, from you and working with the developers to make sure that that project is delivered. 
The next role is a SharePoint project manager. Now, SharePoint project managers are, again, using the kind of the, the standard skills you'd expect to see from a project manager, so planning and scheduling and, and things like that. But they are also, um, they should be aware of how SharePoint works, how it's put together, um, so that they, they know what to expect as part of a SharePoint project. Now, it's quite hard to kind of say without knowing what SharePoint is, what those types of things are, but they should be aware of um, essentially how the development process works, um, the types of things that, that, that SharePoint um, can do and things like that, so that when they're kind of liaising with and communicating with stakeholders, um, they're, they're making it easier to set expectations and aligning the kind of project outcomes and the business objectives so that everybody is on the same page. They, of course, are going to use the same project management skills for things like allocating resources, managing budgets, and overseeing the, the overarching project team. This was a role, again, that I played before I stepped into the development manager role, um, and it was something that I had experienced and, and actually qualified. It's not like I'm blowing my own trumpet a lot here, but I, I am qualified as an agile project manager. Um, got the qualifications for that. Um, but uh, that goes quite well. Agile as a project uh, methodology goes really well with any form of software development um, but of course you could be a project manager which is specialized in like Prince 2 and Waterfall and all that sort of good stuff so you don't necessarily have to be a project manager from any specific background but you, you will tend to find that whoever you're working for will want a certain type of methodology and obviously your experience will match that if you've got some experience with SharePoint I've known SharePoint project managers in the past before they were a project manager by trade, but they had some experience of SharePoint. Maybe it was the fact that they were just using it as part of their day-to-day -day job before they became a SharePoint project manager. Um, so they were aware of what SharePoint was. They knew what it could do. They've used it as an end user themselves. So it made quite a lot of sense to sort of transition into becoming a SharePoint project manager. So that's, so that's that role um, at number five. At number six, we've got SharePoint trainer. Now, again, this is a role that I, I've worn and essentially is what led me down the route of creating my own YouTube channel because I've spent the past decade, um, amongst other things, but wearing the, the role as a hat of a SharePoint trainer, um, which comes along with creating training materials, conducting training sessions, holding workshops, and providing ongoing user support. Um, this could be something quite short term, just like running an afternoon class uh, drop-in sessions, things like that, or it could be something quite long-term. So it could be an adoption strategy which spans over months where you've got different people. Maybe you're doing a kind of train-the-trainer approach where you're bringing people in who are heads of department or delegate, delegated um, sort of people from departments who you give them expertise, knowledge, train them up, and then they go off and they sort of become the kind of first-line support within their own department, things like that. But as a SharePoint trainer... Um, when I was doing it years ago, it was a lot of being out and about, um, talking in person to people, going into rooms, everyone's brought their laptops and things like that. And you try and give them little kind of sandbox solutions to go and build and, um, that sort of stuff. Um, nowadays it's a lot more kind of remote, so you can be a SharePoint trainer and you can work completely remote. You can do it via Teams um, and, and sort of show people things. You can record it and then provide them as videos afterwards. There's loads of different ways that you could approach being a SharePoint trainer. Um, I've only ever done it as a kind of B2B to, to other kind of businesses. But, of course, there'll be share, roles for SharePoint trainers which are in-house. So large organizations which are using SharePoint and they want to make sure that everyone's using it effectively and efficiently they will have a SharePoint trainer in-house to make sure that everybody is using it as they should be. So that's the number six. And number seven, we've got SharePoint intranet slash content manager. Now, this role quite often stems from a kind of marketing or communications type department. Um, quite often, I've, I've met a lot of people who, who aren't, who have never actually even... Um, use SharePoint Pass before, but they've used other types of intranet platforms. So they know what to expect in terms of there's going to be news, there's going to be events, there's going to be documents, there's going to be files and policies and procedures, there's going to be announcements and all sorts of 
useful links and key things that they want to share by an intranet portal. So I've worked with a lot of these people and trained them up so that they can get the fundamental understanding of what, how SharePoint works so they can use all these different aspects. Um, also, I've had people reach out to me who um, I've been working in slightly different roles, maybe like HR, for example, and they're then looking to move more into SharePoint because as part of their role, they've been using it for managing policies and procedures and things like that. And then they want to actually be able to um, move into using SharePoint a lot more, maybe as a SharePoint administrator or as a citizen developer type role, building out more solutions for more departments. But I've seen a lot of people going into this kind of role. Um, you tend to find people get into this role via something else. Um, you do see this job advertised. Um, it's not like you don't ever see it advertised, but it's not as advertised as often as maybe more the technical roles are because this particular role, you should be specializing more in content creation and have a background in marketing, maybe a good understanding of things like SEO. So you know how that content can be searched properly and people can find it using keywords and things like that, rather than being a techie tech person um, who understands all the kind of technical jargon and things like that in the background. It's usually a lot more kind of communications driven, marketing driven than it is IT technical driven type of role. Okay, so that was number seven. At number eight, we've got SharePoint support. Now, this is actually how I started off my journey um, working in SharePoint. It was actually a role that um, I had whilst working at a very large bank. Um, it was something that I started off the journey of working with um, SharePoint. I think it was SharePoint 2003 when I first started working with it. Then it went to SharePoint in 2007, 2010, 13, 16. And then after that, I basically went to SharePoint online. Um, I started using that predominantly for the, the past five years. Um, but from a SharePoint support perspective, very large organizations tend to have a kind of first, second, third line um, types of support desks. First line support, as I, I went into that and I had no experience in SharePoint before. Um, I was kind of learning on my feet um, and a lot of the skills which will get you into that are soft skills, communication, do you know what I mean? Working things out, being sort of, um, being able to look at something and, and think, okay, what's the best way forward with this? Um, being able to also learn quite quickly, looking at kind of guides and materials and that sort of thing to be able to um, upskill in, in common situations that there might be errors, might be issues that, that organization is already aware of that you can follow materials to be able to fix. Um, of course, then you've got second line. So if you if first line can't solve it, they'll escalate to the second line. Um, we actually were working with some quite experienced second line um, SharePoint support people. So I got to learn a lot from them. So those guys were really good, really cool. Um, and then there was a third line support. So third line support then went to a lot more technical sort of people who had a lot less support tickets because they were mostly focusing on um, keeping the environment running. They were more kind of like that SharePoint admin job that we were talking at, at the beginning. Um, and then again, you might have a fourth layer, but those are usually more your kind of architects, your consultants and things like that, which they only get escalated to if it's maybe something that's really a problem, maybe something that's been related to, um, and they might be a development team as well. It might be something that's related to a custom build that the sport desk just doesn't know about. And it just needs to go back to that kind of developers, consultants, architects to say, there's this problem. We think it's related to a, a recent change that was just taking place. Can you help us out? So that's how the SharePoint support works. Then we've got SharePoint consultant. So this is all about providing expert advice on SharePoint solutions. Um, it often encompasses sort of architecture and overarching best practices. So SharePoint, as a SharePoint consultant, that's probably the hat I've worn the most in my career of SharePoint over the past 10 plus years. Um, I've actually worn it mostly, um, as I say, as a role, which is a B2B, um, where I've been a SharePoint consultant going out, um, gathering requirements, a bit like using a business analysis, but then it takes it further because you're not just gathering requirements, you're also architecting a solution as you go along, um, building something out with the customer, uh, maybe proof of concepts and things like that, not building out full projects, but sort of enough 
knowledge that you can help sort of say, what about this? Option A, option B, what do you like more? That sort of thing. Maybe mocking together a bit of a wireframe of what it could look like so the customer understands what the, the user experience will be like. Um, also, quite often the consultants, they need to be either got a bit of background in kind of sales, but definitely need to be quite commercially aware because those SharePoint consultants are the same people that are going to be writing out full project proposals to actually say, this is how long this is going to take to build, and this is how much we think it's going to cost to build. They will obviously work with the salespeople to make sure that they're aligned, but the SharePoint consultants are usually these kind of um, almost like pre-sales type people. Um, so they will have to know how much they think this project is going to be able to cost. Often consultants, as I say, are brought in on pre-sales calls. So before they've even gone down the route of workshopping with a customer, proof of concepts and designs and specifications, they also join short calls with customers, with the salespeople to answer questions, just to make sure that we get the kind of the, the first step in the door, evidence that we know what we're talking about and what we, we are specialists in what we do with SharePoint. And then from there, obviously, the, the, the supporting the full life cycle of the project. Also, quite often, SharePoint consultants are um, pulled into a very large SharePoint projects as a kind of um, the person who's kind of leading the charge at the front. They're, they're speaking with customers. So maybe the project's now been sold, and then they're that sort of first point of call for a customer um, that needs to be kind of um, coordinated making sure that a project is technically sound. So they're not necessarily like as a project manager to describe, but they are somebody who is making sure that the project is staying on track from a technical perspective. There's nothing that say, a developer or any anybody who's kind of building up the solution um, might be getting wrong or falling down as kind of like um, some common mistakes. Shepherd consultants usually have been working in the industry for a lot longer than most of the job types because it is almost the top of the Christmas tree that the SharePoint consultant role. So they will know kind of a lot of the pitfalls, the problems, and be able to advise and guide and make sure that projects don't go down those types of paths because they'll have seen it all before. So they'll be able to say, don't do that because of X reason, for example. So that is our SharePoint consultant role at number nine. And number 10, we've got SharePoint migration engineer. So I've put this in here at the end um, because SharePoint migration in itself, um, you tend to find a lot of contractors get involved with being a SharePoint migration engineer. Um, and, and it's almost a, well, it is a skill set in itself. You do see job specifications purely just for migration related projects. So you do often see them more as a contract type role. Um, so SharePoint migration engineers, they go in, they assess the data, look at where it's going from point A to point B, you map that content. They work with end users to understand what type of content can be purged, got rid of, cleaned up, moved around, put into a new structure, um, and ensure the successful migration with minimal disruption. That's a really key point, the minimal disruption. And there's a lot of different types of migrations, and different types of ways that you can migrate. You can go with a kind of what I call a big bang approach, which is get everything over straight away. Now you tend to only do that if there's a real reason to do that. If it's say, for example, you're moving away from a platform which is broken. So I've worked in a case before where there's a small kind of organization and they were heavily reliant on this server, which they basically had under a kitchen sink. Um, and that, that kind of just blew up one day. And then they were like, right, well, we need access to all the files which was on that. We've got Microsoft 365 at the time, which is Office 365. And we need to get it onto SharePoint. We need to get using it quick. We don't have time for any cleansing of the data. We just need to get it up there, get people access. And we want to turn this around ASAP. We need, it was, I think on Monday we got the call and they basically wanted within days, they wanted by the end of the week that it was all back up and running. So essentially we had a kind of engineer go out, extract the data, get the data from the server, put it onto a, a hard drive that we could access. And then we migrated that using a set of tools into SharePoint Online. Afterwards, again, there's a lot of consultancy um, involved with actually then splitting out, making sure that SharePoint wasn't just this dumping ground of one big pile of documents, because that isn't the way that SharePoint should be used. Um, and we helped the architect it afterwards. That was that was one example of how we did that as a quick cut over kind of big bang migration. There's other types of migrations though, that there might be small drip fed things, something that 
maybe you're moving things across, but you know you've got, say, two years to do it. So you can have a guinea pig or a pilot group of people that are going to be migrated and using new versions of SharePoint or Microsoft Teams, for example. Um, and then you've got to drip feed it through over a period of time, learning and iterating as you go. But as a SharePoint migration engineer or specialist, as they're sometimes called, um, you need to know about all these different migration methods. Um, you also need to know about how SharePoint should be architected. Um, so quite often SharePoint migration specialists or engineers are consultants, essentially they've been doing it for a long time. You also need to know different types of migrational tools. So you'd need to know about the free tool that Microsoft offers, but there's also third party migrational tools as well that you need to know about what the costs are, the pros, the cons, the benefits of the different tools, why you'd use one over another and things like that. Again, all things that you gain with kind of experience uh, and understanding of how migrational projects would work. Um, so yeah, so essentially that is how um, uh, the, the, the kind of 10 roles. Um, I hope you found that really useful. If you did, please, you know, the common drills, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Also check out my membership um, on my channel because there's some exclusive videos that you can access, more training, um, more videos that you wouldn't be able to access normally. So go check that out. And thank you very much for watching this video.